Welcome to the Young Adult Author Panel at Pflugerville Library Con. I'm so excited today to have some amazing authors joining us from across the country. Um, so let's, we have lots of questions, so let's just jump in and get started. Um, first up, we have Kaylin Bayron, who is an author and classically trained via, uh, vocalist. Her debut novel, Cinderella is Dead, uh, just released in July. She grew up in Anchorage, and when she's not writing, you can find her listening to Ella Fitzgerald on loop, attending the theater, watching scary movies, and spending time with her kids. She currently lives in San Antonio. Um, Raquel Vasquez Gilliland is a Mexican American poet, novelist, and painter. Her debut novel, YA novel, sorry, Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything was just released last month. She received her Master of Fine Arts in Poetry from the University of Alaska in 2017. So we've got two Alaska authors here. Um, she's most inspired by fog and seeds and the lineages of all things. When not writing, Raquel tells stories to her plants and they tell her stories back. She lives in Tennessee with her family in mountains. Sara Saidi it was born in Tehran, Iran, and immigrated to the Bay Area with her family in 1982, where they remained undocumented for 20 years. Once a creative executive at ABC Daytime, Sarah now writes novels for teens and writes TV for everyone, uh, including her YA memoir, Americanized Rebel Without a Green Card, which she's now developing for TV. Uh, her screen work includes the hit drama I Zombie, the ABC drama Grand Hotel, and Katie Keene on The CW. Sara lives in Los Angeles with her husband and their two kids. And last but certainly not least, we've got Natalia Sylvester. She is the author of two novels for adults, Chasing the Sun, and Everyone Knows You Go Home, which won an International Latino Book Award. Running, her debut novel for young adults, is a 2020 Junior Library Guild selection. Born in Lima, Peru, Natalia grew up in Florida and Texas, and she received a BFA in creative writing from the University of Miami. So welcome, all of you, to our session today. Um, let's get started. I have a couple of questions that I got from uh, some of the teens in my teen advisory group, so I want to ask those first to make sure that we get uh, those answered. Um, first question is, can you tell us a little bit about your latest YA book and where did you find the idea that sparked that book? So we'll start with Kaylin. Um, yeah, so Cinderella is Dead um, is the story of 16-year-old Sophia Grimmins. Um, she is a young woman living in the kingdom of Mersai, which is the place where Cinderella lived and died uh, 200 years before. Um, she is, the annual ball is now mandatory and, um, Sophia is preparing to go up to her very first one and she is having none of it. She is in love with her best friend and, um, kind of desperately seeking a way out. So, um, Sophia goes up to the ball and, um, learns some pretty devastating truths about, uh, the kingdom that she lives in, about Prince Charming, about Cinderella uh, the fairy godmother, and um, and even about herself. Um, at its core, it is a book about telling queer Black girls that they are enough, just as they are. And Raquel, can you tell us a little bit about, about a little bit about Cielo Martinez? Sure. Um, the idea for Cielo Martinez came when I was taking a walk in Tallahassee, Florida, and for some reason, I looked at the sky, and it was it just looked so endless, like the sea. And I had the idea of a UFO crashing in the desert. And I knew instantly that the occupant was an undocumented immigrant and that she was looking for her daughter. And so that was the first image that came to me. And later on, I had the idea of a, that same daughter uh, reading a letter to a boy who had been hateful to her in class. So uh, I didn't get to work on it till much later, but. Uh, putting those themes together and figuring out what happened between is where I got the idea for C. Martinez. And Sara? Um, well, my most recent book, Americanized, is a memoir. So the idea was just um, came to me in terms of I had started sort of telling people, oh, yeah, my family, I was undocumented. I didn't get a green card until I was 20. And strangely enough, I didn't think that that was weird news like but the way people reacted to it i was like oh i guess maybe there's a story here and then unfortunately in the 2016 election it just became so topical um 
it felt like a big hot button political issue. And then it became more important to me to share the story because I wanted people to really understand what the immigration process is in the United States and that it's not that easy. And for people to really understand why people come here sometimes out of desperation. And my lit agent and I had actually talked about doing it as a work of fiction. Um, but then it started feeling like I think it's important for people who have gone through this experience to talk about it. Um, and that's why we decided to do it as a memoir. And Natalia? <clears throat> yes, hi. Sorry. Um, thanks for having me here and all of us here today, first of all. It's really exciting to be in conversation with you all. Um, so Running is a story of a 15-year-old Cuban-American girl. She's living in Miami. Her father is a senator who's running for the presidency of the United States. And um, due to all this sudden scrutiny that's happening now to her, in addition to her father, um, she's really starting to see him in a new light and understand his policies better and realizing that even though she has, you know, stood behind him in a very literal way all her life because she's always in the background every time he's giving a speech and she's always clapping and going along with everything he says. Um, even though she stood behind him, she actually doesn't agree with any of his policies. And as she's coming into her own beliefs, her own views, her own power, um, she has to decide what she'll do with it and whether she will raise her voice um, in a way that actually is going to conflict with his campaign and um, join a movement that might, um, you know, really go against a lot of the things that she's been told she should be, like a very quiet and supportive daughter um, who just kind of unquestioningly, um, you know, goes with whatever the family has decided. Uh, so I was really, um, I was inspired by this actually during the 2016 elections. I was watching the news and I saw um, some coverage of a, a candidate who was giving a speech and um, their child, their teenage child was in the background. And I just couldn't stop thinking like, what must they be going through? Um, you know, what, what could happen when this person you saw as your hero really lets you down? And, and not only that, but what does it mean when you've been, um, when you're scared to speak? Because, you know, when I was a teen, I was really afraid to like, I can't even, I think if I told teen me that one day I would be doing like events and actually speaking to people, like she would have just freaked out. She would have been like, no, there's no way because I couldn't even raise my hand in class without breaking into a cold sweat. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think there's something really amazing that comes with finding your voice and realizing like, what are the things you will fight for? And somebody's journey is that. And it's further complicated by the fact that her father's running for president. But I think it's a journey that a lot of us um, maybe have gone through, like what happens when we don't just we don't agree with our loved ones on very important issues. Thank you all so much. Um, all right. And our second question from a teen is what is your favorite part of the writing process? And I'm going to shift a little bit. So we'll start this time with Raquel. So, Raquel, uh, what's your favorite part of the writing process? Um, my favorite part is the very beginning when all possibilities seem to exist and the book is very pristine in my brain and uh, I'm just thinking of names of characters and names of places and um, it's just very, very exciting. And I don't know, it's almost like a dream that you, the most beautiful dream that you're trying to remember and like kind of pulling it out of the ether and onto paper and planning it. That's my favorite. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, what would be your favorite part? Um, I was laughing to myself because I feel like I have the exact opposite answer, which is the, the end <laughs> is my favorite part. Oh, just because I think the beginning and the process gives me a lot of anxiety. I'm always worried that I'm not going to be able to get it right or that it's not good enough. And so I think once I'm at the end of the process, the inner critic quiets down a bit. Um, but I also really love revising because I feel like you have something to work with, but your job is to then improve upon it and make it better. And something about revising doesn't feel quite as intimidating to me as getting started. Um, and then I also think that there's something really gratifying about reading something after you finished it, if it's something that you're happy with and you feel like, oh, I, I was able to do it. I had doubts along the way. but um, and then I, I think you guys can probably all speak to this. Like there's nothing quite like holding a book in your hand when they when they send you the um the arcs. Um so that's always 
really, really exciting. Um, but yeah, the beginning is more daunting to me than than the end. Um, and Natalia, what part do you like best? Yeah, I agree with Sada. Like, I am. I'm actually in rough draft mode right now with my current book, and it's like it's 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 the worst. I <laughs> every single time I write a book, I feel like I don't know how to do it. Um, and I actually found like some journal entries from when I was writing running in which I was like, I, I, uh, this is horrible. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this, you know? And, and so it's kind of reassuring to know I've been here before, but um, I love revising because I think it's a moment when you get to, um, for me anyways, it feels like less pressure of, uh, think there's, there are already words on the page. So at that point, it's not about finishing the draft as it is about just reimagining it and clarifying and actually discovering what you're trying to say all along. Um, because once I have the words down, I can start playing with them. And I can do that in a way that has a little less judgment. Like I judge everything that I write when it's a first draft. Um, and I, I start being like, oh, is this good enough or whatever? And I have to really push myself to just keep going. Um, so, and then the thing about revision too, is that I feel like that's when the surprises happen. Like for me, my favorite part of the writing process is when even though you start out with a story and you have an idea and you think you know where it's going, um, inevitably there's something that comes out that you didn't realize was there. And it's like, it's telling you something about yourself that um, feels completely true, but you are only just now encountering it. So in a way you're getting to know yourself as you're discovering the story. Thank you. And um, Kaylin, what do you think? What's your favorite part of the writing process? Um, I really enjoy revising. Um, I think that I, I used to be really, really hard on myself with first drafts um, and second drafts and, you know, all the things that come before. But that um, that pressure is, is kind of alleviated when, um, you know, when you kind of think about it as telling yourself the story, like those first uh, you know, the first draft, that is a, that's me telling myself the story. When, by the time I get to revisions, I'm starting to kind of turn the lens a little. I'm starting to kind of turn turn it around and, and look at it more from a reader's point of view. Um, and that's uh, been hugely helpful to me. So I have really leaned into the revising process that really, I really feel like um, I'm doing my best work in that space. Um, and then before that, I'm just kind of telling myself the stories. So yeah, revising is, is uh, that's, that's kind of where I shine, I think. Thank you. Um, and my next question I'm really interested in hearing about because you guys all have such different books. Um, we've got fantasy and sci-fi and realistic fiction and memoir. And so um, what kind of research did you have to do to prepare for your book? Um, I'm so curious because I imagine everybody's answer is going to be very different. <laughs> Um, we'll start with Sara. Um, yeah, I actually, I usually like to steer clear of anything that I have to research because I'm lazy. Um, not because I'm lazy, but because I like to dive in. Um, but I actually did do a fair amount of research for my memoir because, um, I mean, the best part of it was going to my parents and asking them to share stories about our life that I'd either heard over the years, but I wanted to, I wanted them to be more fresh in my mind. Um, to ask about my grandparents, um, ask about their experiences living in Iran. And then I also luckily journaled a lot as a high school student. And so going back and reading my own diaries from when I was like 14 to when I was 18 was so fascinating and eye-opening. Um, it, it was illuminating and that I didn't, I didn't write about being undocumented that often. Like I was, I was more concerned still with things like the boy that I had a crush on in school or fights with my friends. Um, and then the part of it that was a little bit depressing, to be honest, is that some of the same hangups and insecurities I had as a 14 or 15 year old girl were some of the things I was still struggling with as a woman in my 30s. Um, so that was really eye opening. So I feel like I did learn a lot about myself through that process. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of like talking to family and reading journals from my past. Thank you. And uh, Natalia, what about you? Did you have to do any kind of research for running? No, yeah, oh, absolutely. And uh, Sarah, I agree with you. I actually have a lot of journals and they help me so much. Um, but uh, so I think I started out mostly uh, because my father's never run for president. Um, <laughs> uh, I read a lot of um, memoirs of um, politicians and their children. Um, I kind of really wanted to get behind the whole because we see so much news coverage, but it doesn't ever really show you like the 
you know, the real everyday life moments. And I was really interested in what are the more personal, um, intimate moments and even mundane ones actually that are not just this like, you know, big larger than life thing that we associate with campaigns. Um, I, I mean, I, I watched a lot of like documentaries on politicians' lives and also at the time that I was writing Running, and I think this is still happening now, like there's so many more people running for office at every level that even like friends of mine or acquaintances of mine um, were running for the first time, like at the local level. And it was really eye opening, um, you know, as you know, to see everything that went into that and see how they're navigating this, um, both just individually and as, fam as a family. Um, but in terms of the voice, because this was my first YA book and because, you know, I'd previously written for adults, I really leaned into my journals because I kept them since I was like six and I found entries from when I was a teen. And I, I found my first feminist manifesto um, <laughs> in which I was very upset about the gender power dynamics in my family. And I, I wrote something like, you know, this is the 90s. Women and men can success equally because I even had a grammar, like a typo in it. It was great. Um, but it was just such a wonderful reminder of um, how strongly I felt about so many things at that age, even if I didn't. Because I think we can talk, we can often like talk down a lot to kids, especially when um, we're older and we feel like, oh, you know, one day none of this will matter. And like I, I say, I hear that being said a lot. And I think it's so, it's such a disservice to how much, like how deeply like we care about things at that age, um, how big things really are because they're, they're shaping us. They're like shaping who we will become. And so I just, I saw in my younger self, like a woman who, like a young woman who had a lot of questions. And even if I didn't have all the answers, the questions were something that was guiding me constantly. Uh, and I, I really embraced that when I was writing Running. Thank you. Um, and Kaylin, uh, what about you? Did you have to do some kind of research for writing uh, Cinderella? Um, yeah, so I did. Um, I did a lot of rereading um, because Cinderella is kind of a um, kind of a it's a retelling, but it is. I like to think of it more of like a remix. It's um, but I did go back and and reread a lot of fairy tales, Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, all those, you know, all those very familiar um, fairy tales. And I also um, tried to go back and find the earliest versions of Cinderella that I could find or stories that were similar to Cinderella um, and translated versions. And um, so I, I also reread Wicked, which happens to be my favorite um, retelling ever. And so I reread that. And yeah, it was, you know, um, I really wanted to examine the fairy tale construct and I really wanted to interrogate how damaging um, that that way of storytelling can be, um, especially to um, queer black girls. Um, so um, because they tend to be very, you know, patriarchal, very um, heteronormative and very white. So um, I wanted to deconstruct all of those those ideas and just kind of uh, find a new entry point. And so it was important for me to kind of have all of these, these stories, um, you know, there, and I could kind of draw a line to what was working and what didn't work and what I had questions about. And so, yeah, it was just a lot of rereading a lot of old <laughs> fairy tales and then, you know, kind of re-enjoying some things that I really love, like, um, Cinderella with Brandy as Cinderella and Whitney Houston as the fairy godmother. So those are those are my favorite, you know, kind of things. And so, yeah, I just got to kind of lean into to all of these these fairy tales. I'm very jealous if you were able to find a streaming version of that Cinderella. I've been looking for it and I can't. Yeah, find it. <laughs> yeah it's out there. And we did a we did like a release like when Cinderella's Dead came out. We did like a party with uh, the Rave app, and we got the video, and all of us kind of watched it at the same time. So yeah, I just love that. I love it. I love that. Version. It's such yes, it's so it's good. So good. <laughs> um, and Raquel, what about you? What kind of research did you have to do? And I'm gonna be so excited if you say you had to watch a bunch of episodes of X Files. Um, actually, I didn't watch a ton of X-Files before, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you. I I have watched like all 10 or 7 seasons, however much it was, so shortly before writing. So um, when I did reference the X-Files, I kind of double checked. So that was a little bit of that research. Um, I made sure to ask my family about old folk tales that they used to tell. 
um, because a lot of that is in the book. And I did some research on uh, astrology. Um, in particular, Sia does a astrological project with the moon. So I looked up some interesting facts on the moon. Um, I'm trying to think of one. I feel like I'm going to get it wrong. I feel like moon dust smells like, uh, I forget, what is it in guns? Like bullet powder? I'm getting the word wrong. Uh, gun, gun. <laughs> that's the word, gunpowder. That thing inside guns is gunpowder. Something on the moon smells like that. I'm not remembering everything. And uh, the last bit was, um, oh, I feel like I had three elements of research and now I'm forgetting one of them. Oh, no, it was Phoenix because it's set in Phoenix. And I've only visited Phoenix one time. So right before writing this book, I made friends with a writer who lived in Phoenix. And so my research was constantly texting her. Is, do you guys have this in Phoenix? Can you see the stars in Phoenix? Things like that. So the, I didn't do a ton compared to a book I'm working on now. But I did, you know, moderate amounts throughout the writing of it. Good job on the research on Phoenix because it sounded beautiful <laughs> when I read that. It was it was beautifully described. Um, let's see. So next up, uh, okay. One thing that I really loved about all of your books is that all of them featured young people that were finding their voices and being coming more confident in who they were. Um, was that a conscious decision or is that something that just came about naturally as you were writing the book? Um, let's see. And I think we'll start with, um, I forget what order we're in. We're going to start with Kaylin. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a combination of things. Um, for me, it's it's definitely um, you know a conscious decision, but I think it stems from um, really um, for me, you know, having having had all of these fairy tales around um, as a kid, and then being you know just an avid reader as a teenager, um, I did not see people who looked like me um, in these these um these stories and so it was really important for me to have a character um at the at the center of this story who was saying you know wait a minute there's there's something wrong here i'm on the out i feel like i'm on the outside looking in and that is kind of that's kind of where i started um sophia you know she spends the entire narrative you know she, she begins knowing who she is and what she wants. That's where she starts. And so it kind of, from there, it goes to, well, society, you know, all of these societal norms and all of these kind of, um, these generational practices are so damaging to her. Um, so I, I wanted to look at this story from the point of view of, you know, this person who already knows who she is and what she wants. How does she then convey that to the people around her and how do they react to that? And what is she willing to do when she realizes that she, um, she's not going to get what she wants just by asking for it. Um, she is going to have to take it. And so, um, so for me, it's, it, you know, it's a conscious decision to have this character, but, uh, to, you know, who's there raising her voice. But I think that that's just kind of the natural progression of things, um, considering what I based this story on and why I wrote it. So, um, so yeah, it was a, a, a conscious decision, but um, one that feels very kind of organic uh, for the story. Thank you. And um, Raquel, uh, what about you? Uh, was that something that just kind of came about as part of the story or was it an intentional decision? You know, interestingly, I had someone ask me recently because I wrote a, an essay for Las Musas, the a collective and it was about me working through internalized racism and writing my first attempts at a novel. And uh, the interviewer asked me, Sia never has internalized racism. She always knows what's right and what's wrong um, with the people who are, uh, who are racist and, and uh, perform microaggressions against her and her family. And she said, uh, you know, how did you come to having a character who is so confident and so, uh, so self-aware um, when you, you know, in this essay, you reveal your own struggle? And I said, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I didn't realize that there was this sort of um, 
uh, in not, I can't put the words together right now. I have a migraine. Let me just announce that right now. So my words aren't connecting. Um, it's not consistent with Sia versus my own experience as a teenager and young adult. So um, I feel it wasn't conscious, but I feel as though I wrote Sia almost as a sort of love letter to my young self saying, this is who you can be. And uh, this is uh, how powerful you can be once you realize um, what you have internalized and sort of purged it. Thank you. And I'm so sorry to hear about the migraine. <laughs> um, Sara, uh, what about you? And uh, I know your, your, your confident voice in there is your own. So, <laughs> Well, first of all, I want to say, Raquel, for somebody that has a, if you're that eloquent when you have a migraine, I want to know how things are when you don't, because <laughs> I would be laying in bed right now. Um, but I, I was just thinking about it, hearing everyone else speak. I don't know that it was intentional, but I guess there's I end the book older, so I guess you would hope that there's a little bit of growth there. But I think that what, what I was trying to get across, maybe more subconsciously than consciously, was that there needed to be a level of self-acceptance that getting a green card and becoming a citizen wouldn't necessarily mean that I would be fine and confident and happy with who I was. And um, we got our green cards in the year 2000, and then 9-11 happened. So suddenly there was other, you know, other obstacles in terms of we finally had a green card and we could that meant we could leave the country and travel but suddenly no other countries wanted people from iran coming to visit um so it wasn't sort of like the easy solution suddenly to all of my problems um but yeah i think what one of the takeaways that i wanted to give younger readers is that you know you do grow and you do change and you do have to get to a point where you are happy with yourself and accept yourself but people aren't going to necessarily give that to you. That's something that you have to figure out on your own sometime. Thank you. And Natalia? Yeah. Um, I also don't know that it was like a very, you know, I, I think it was probably a subconscious thing I was working through as I was writing Muddy. Like the first thing that came to me was always her voice. Like it was the first few pages I wrote. They were very voice driven. They were very much about her just starting to realize the ways the things that she's told just don't track with the realities that she sees. Um, and at the same time, I was writing writing at a time, like this was, I started writing it before the election. I couldn't write for a really long time after. And around 2017, when I myself was involved in a lot of activism and kind of navigating my my own way in that and trying to figure out like, what is that? Um, what will that look like in my own life? I think a lot of us, we're thinking of that too. And I also was very aware of what a privilege it was to only feel like it was ha like, like so many of us were suddenly like thinking of all these injustices when they've been happening. So for so long, like they're, they're the foundations of our whole country. Um, and so what does it mean? Uh, like somebody like Maddie, who um, she's not only realizing her own beliefs, but she's also having to unpack her own privilege and learn a lot of toxicity that she's internalized, like about, you know, just through her being part of um, a family that's very patriarchal, um, dealing with a lot of machismo in her, in her in her culture that's perpetuated not only by the men in her family, but also by the women. Um, what does it mean when you're someone who has experience being marginalized, but are also, um, can also be capable of further oppressing others? Um, just through your own privilege, just through like, you know, the power that her father has and her not questioning it and kind of going along with it. So I just, I wanted, um, and it was hard for, it was hard for me to write her at first because I very, I wanted her to really quickly like learn things. <laughs> like, Cause I, um, and I had to, I had to realize that she was going to um, come into it in her own way. Um, <clears throat> And as she did that, I think that it actually ended up teaching me a lot. So, um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I just think that that's such an important thing for us all to understand. And it was actually kind of enlightening to see her sometimes stumble. Um, because to me, like, there's a lot of people in her life who are activists who are much more aware of um, the injustices of the world, who are much more involved in taking action. Um, but you know, she's learning from them as she goes. And so she's not going to get it all right. And to me, I felt like, well, that's okay. So, so long as she's learning, you know, so long as she's like 
not just deciding to um, be stuck in like her talk, like in her own, in ways that can, in ways that can continue to harm. Um, so, you know. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question is uh, something I actually asked my team book club way back in January when uh, they read Sara's book, Americanized. Um, we talked about what they thought of the word rebel and what that word meant to them if it had positive or negative connotations, because I feel like it sometimes has different connotations, how it's used and when in history and all that. So I'm just curious, what is y'all's take on the word rebel? By the way, they were all raised on the Hunger Games, so they had a very positive take on that word. Um, Kaylin? Um, yeah, so I think I think maybe maybe initially when I think of that word, I think of, you know, someone who's kind of very outspoken and maybe, you know, kind of always fighting for what they believe to be right. But I, but I also think that there's a more kind of subtle context there that, that um, can sometimes be undervalued. And that is, um, you know, that is the power of telling the truth. I think that no matter, no matter, um, no matter how it comes down in the end, I think it's important to tell the truth. Um, and so I think that in today's world, telling the truth has, you know, become an act of resistance. Um, so I think that, um, I think that that's, that's kind of where I think about it. If I'm thinking about people who are rebellious and rebellion, I think it starts with, um, telling the whole truth and, um, and, continuing to tell that truth on a, on a daily basis, because I think every day with, you know, media and, and social media and news and all those kinds of things are kind of inundated with all of these things. And it can be hard to kind of parse through um, what is true and, and what's not. So um, I think um, for me, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it is for me. And uh, Raquel? Um, I have my undergraduate degree in culture anthropology. And so when I hear the word rebel, I think this is one of the fastest and most powerful ways you can change cultures, uh, your cultural beliefs and uh, the cultural experience is through rebellions and rebels who challenge what we have been taught our whole lives. So I've always thought of it as something positive. And as a teenager, I was very much a rebel. One of the hugest ways I rebelled was leaving the Catholic Church, which I, I was raised in since I was a baby. And that was just so formative and so difficult. And I just, I don't know, I, I have a lot of positive connotations with the word. Thank you. And Sarah? Um, it's funny because for Americanized, there's a chapter about my sister, and that chapter was originally titled Rebel Without a Green Card, because growing up, she seemed so rebellious to me. She was sort of the rule breaker and the troublemaker. And she was the girl that didn't have a green card, but was still like sneaking off to go to Mexico with her friends for spring break. Um, and then my editor was like, it's such a great, it should be the part of the book title uh, because I never felt rebellious growing up. I felt like I was the kid that like, you know, got the good grades and did everything right. And now looking back on it, I mean, to, Echo what Kaylin says too. I think just being true to yourself can be an act of rebellion. I think in some ways I was still very true to myself, and there was um, things that maybe my parents and I didn't always see eye to eye on culturally, but that I was willing to argue my points and have a voice in our household, and they were able to respect that. I mean, I think as a teenager, um, and I think Natalia's book hits on these themes, um, just in terms of not being afraid to say what your truth is, even if the people, if, even if you know that the people around you may disagree. Um, and I think that is something we're seeing a lot of young people do today, which is very inspiring. And Natalia? Yeah. Um, oh my God. I, I agree so much. I, um, you know, there's, I think that when you, when you, when there are negative connotations to rebel, I question it because it's usually something used by those already in power to just keep the peace and keep those who would rebel from fighting and changing it. And um, actually in running, there's um, there's this there's this one scene where her dad, Maddie's dad, calls her activist friends like a bunch of malcriados, like they're just these rude troublemakers. Um, and she's starting to realize that how much that can be weaponized, um, that just because they're trying to create change um, doesn't make them bad. And in fact, um, 
it just means that you have to question like, yeah, like who, who, do, who does this serve? You know, when we, I think of a rebel, I think of fighting. I think of, um, you know, embracing your power and deciding that you're going to like stand up for something. And sometimes that will upset some people, but again, it's because they're being served by the systems that are already in place. Um, and so I think a lot of times, especially the other thing I was really aware of as I was writing running, is that like Muddy's 15. So I know a lot of times that the book ends up, um, people end up saying, well, it's important to vote and everything, but I'm like, she can't vote. Neither can her friends, you know? And I grew up not like my family, my parents didn't become citizens until I was like 17, almost 18. And so we lived our whole, like my whole childhood being affected by policies um, that we had no say in. Um, and I think a lot about um, about the different ways we can rebel and how can it doesn't have to look one way. And sometimes just us raising our voices and being intentional in our actions um, is is you know is, is can be that catalyst for that change and kind of disrupt the power structures that are not serving us. All right. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Natalia. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to see how much time we have left. See how many questions, more questions we can get to. Uh, let's see. We'll go to this one. Uh, so, just historically, throughout uh, time and literature, uh, marginalized groups of people have generally not been well represented. Represented in um, young literature uh, and literature for kids and teens and young adults. Um, so it's starting to change a little bit. I can tell just when I'm ordering books that it's a little bit easy. It's it's gotten a little bit easier to find some good representation than it was even five years ago. But I know it's something that is we, you know, everybody needs to keep making efforts if we want to keep that um, an ongoing thing and not have it just be a little blip in the radar that 10 years from now, no one will know happened. So uh, for you guys, what is your advice to young writers that are coming um, from these marginalized communities to encourage them? And what would you say uh, the gatekeepers in um, the book world, so the librarians and the teachers and the uh, booksellers and the publishers and the agents, all of them, what would you say they can do to support those young writers? Um, and we'll start uh, with, uh, we'll go backwards. So we'll go start with uh, with uh, Natalia. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think for writers in particular, there's a lot we internalized when we are marginalized. And I think one of those things that we internalize is that we have to somehow like be accepted in. Um, and I would say to that, like, you know, resist that, you know, just write for yourself, write for your community, write as if you're the ones at the center of your universe, because you are, and, um, you know, others need to see themselves, um, uh, in that same place without having to, um, you know, cater to this idea that you're trying to prove your humanity to someone. Um, it's, it's really disheartening for me when I see books um, by marginalized people only being shared as a way to like teach lessons about oppression. Um, it, it kind of gives us the message that the only thing we're worth, that the only thing we have a value is to share our pain. And like we have to somehow perform it or um, we have to um, be hurting in order to be heard. And I think that's something that is so limiting and um, and so hard to, to constantly have to process. And we have so much, like, and it's not to say that you're not allowed to write your pain. You know, of course we are, like, but who are we writing for? And I think, you know, write for yourself, write for the stories that you need in the world. Um, and those of you who are in, in the places of power to share it with others, you know, of course share it with other marginalized youth, but also, you know, when you share it with those who aren't, don't share it as if it were a lesson. Um, share it as if, you know, it has just as much value as anybody else's because it does. And I grew up my, like, when I, first stories I ever wrote when I was little were mostly about, like, you know, white children who, like, who had been born here and um, because I didn't see my own stories as valid. And that's, that's something that took years to have to, like, unlearn. And I hope that um, our youth today don't ever even have to, like, deal with that. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah? Um so it was so interesting to hear that because I feel like I did the same thing. Like I, I started out as a film and TV writer and then I wrote two novels before Americanized. 
And so many of the things that I had written had white people at the center of the stories. And in film and TV, it's sort of, you're sort of trained to think, like, if I can't get, like, Jennifer Aniston attached to this project, then it's never going to get made. Like, the only people that I can be writing for are these movie stars or actors that could get something made. And they all happen to be white, you know? And this is not, like, 10, 15 years ago. I'm talking, like, five or six years ago. Um, and it just almost, like, you, it almost, like, never occurred to me to write something of, with an Iranian girl at the center of it, which is so strange because one of the things you're always told as a writer, it's like the biggest cliche is write what you know. Um, And then I finally did. I finally wrote a book about myself. um, And that's opened so many more doors in my career than anything else that I've ever done. So I think, yeah, my advice to younger writers uh, who may come from marginalized backgrounds is don't be afraid to share your story because it is valid and people are interested. You know, I think that was a big battle for me is like, is anybody going to be interested in a story about myself? Um, and then I would say just in terms of, I think in the publishing industry and in the film and television industry, there's definitely a lot of emphasis now on being more inclusive, which is great. But I think that I'm still seeing a lot of like, oh, well, I already have a a, a book on my list by an Iranian writer. And I think just because two people are Iranian of, or of the same background doesn't mean that they have the exact same thing to say. Um, so I think editors and publishing houses really need to understand that we all have like a vast backgrounds and experiences. And just because we're from the same country or our parents are from the same country doesn't mean that our lives are identical. Thank you very much. And uh, Raquel? Um, I agree completely with everything. My first novels I wrote from when I was a child to a young adult were about light-eyed girls with straight, light hair. And I just, I had internalized without even realizing it that those are the stories that people care about. And Sia was actually the first book I wrote that featured a Mexican-American protagonist. And it, and it is like mind blowing to think that it took that long. And I've lived my whole life as a Mexican American woman, young adult and girl. So um, I wanted to share when I first queried Sia and when Sia also went on sub, um, about half of the feedback I received was, can we please take out the sci-fi? Because people wanted it to be this immigration story that is what the first half of the book is but the most important part of this book to me was seeing a young brown girl kicking alien butt like i just wanted her to fight and have superpowers and defend her family and just be so powerful and so i was like over and over i said no i'm not changing this part of the book and so that would be part of my advice to young people who are marginalized, who are writing their own stories, is don't change what is important to you. Um, There are some things, there's some feedback you're going to get back that, um, I don't know, I feel like in your heart, you know, what is the heart of the book and what needs to stay and what can be molded into something that's going to make it better. And uh, some of the feedback I received from those gatekeepers were, I just couldn't connect with this voice. And so I feel as though if, as a gatekeeper, your first um, impression with a novel by a marginalized author is, I can't connect with this voice, um, I want, I would advise you to examine that and question why you you personally need to connect. Because um, we are, we have been, I mean, culturally, we have been told what stories are important and so, and what stories we can easily connect with. And so the stories that are by marginalized people just um, really examine your reaction. And, uh, and yeah, that's it. I am so glad you didn't take out the aliens. That would not have been the same book at all. (laughs) It was awesome. Um, Let's see, Kaylin, uh, what do you think? Um, yeah, I agree with everything um, that Raquel just said. Like, I was, I'm trying very hard to like keep it professional, but I wanted to like scream, like, yes, that is exactly right. And it's such a universal experience for marginalized writers. Um, but 
you know, for young writers, I think um, we need your stories. Your stories are important. Um, there is a place for them. Um, that, you know, that advice is pretty, you know, I, I say that a lot, but it's true. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. The advice to publishing is another story. Um, there has been a push for more inclusion, but I think that we need more um, Black, Indigenous, people of color at the editorial level because um, at the acquiring, you know, that, that have the power to acquire new things because um, I, I run into some stumbling blocks there um, with people who have assumptions about what, um, you know, Black people do and do not do, how they act, what they look like, what they don't look like. Um, and so it's, you're trying to tell this story that you want to tell, but then you get to a certain point and you're like, well, I, I can't tell it because I'm, I'm being asked to change it. Not me, not personally with this story or my publisher right now, but this is another thing that, that I've run into. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's I think it's important that publishing um, diversifies across the board, across all um, levels, and I also think that it's important for them to put the muscle behind us. Um, you know, kind of there's this kind of like self fulfilling prophecy in publishing where it's kind of like you acquire this book that maybe is by and about you know a marginalized group of people, and then you don't really put the muscle behind it uh, to support it with marketing and promo and then um it doesn't do as well and then you turn to the writer and say well see it didn't really it didn't really do what we wanted it to do but and then it just kind of repeats and so um you know put put the muscle behind us there our readers are waiting they are out there um they um they want these stories and if um if you treat titles the same way, you know, by black indigenous people of color, by queer writers, by, you know, if you treat us the same way that you treat white straight authors, um, you, you'll get the result you're looking for. They know how to make a book work. They know how to market it. They know what to do. Um, so it's really not about um, anything other than a bias. Um, and so, um, so that's, it, it's still, we have a lot of work to do. There are so many amazing, talented, um, writers and, um, but we just, we have a lot of work to do. So, um, so yeah, it, it seems like a tough kind of situation, but we are, we're making progress, but it is slow. Um, but I think, um, I, I, you know, that sounds kind of, kind of, you know, uh, like there's not a silver lining, but the silver lining is, is that more and more people are getting their stories out there um, from marginalized backgrounds. And um, we are, we have always been here. We've always been putting in the work and it's really just about um, making sure that we have equal opportunity, equal access. Um, so, so yeah. Thank you. And we're almost out of time. So I'm going to jump to our last couple questions and just combine them. Um, so let's see, what do you want readers to take away from your book, especially young readers, the intended uh, young adult audience? And what are you currently working on if you're allowed to tell us? And we'll start with uh, Raquel. Um, I keep saying I want people, especially young people, to read my book and just feel more wonder at the universe. And I want them to feel inspired to write their own stories or make their own art. And I keep getting this feedback um, that makes me cry, but I think I'm going to hold it together, <laughs> which is uh, Mexican-American uh, readers come to me and say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I see myself in a story. So I want them to have that, too. I'm almost crying, but I'm going to take I'm going to hold it together. And the second question, oh, I'm working on a book. I'm like reaching as though it's here. It's not, the cover hasn't been revealed yet. It's called uh, How Moon Fuentes Fell in Love with the Universe. And it's about Moon, a girl who's half Mexican um, American and half white, her father's uh, white Mexican and uh, processing uh the experience of being the ugly twin to a sister who's white passing and uh she it's a it's a rom-com i had to write something a lot lighter and more fun after sia just to um i don't know that's what i have to do go go to heavy books and then to light books so that's it's a rom-com that's that 
uh, on a road trip and her love interest is uh, Santiago and he's an aspiring chef and they hate each other at first. So uh, that's coming. I think the cover reveals next month. So uh, keep an eye on that. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that. And uh, Sara, what do you have coming up next and what do you hope readers take away? Um, for what I hope readers take away, I hope readers that are also undocumented or who have parents who may be undocumented, um, I hope that the takeaway is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and, um, or that at least that they feel seen in reading the book that other people have gone through this experience. And then what I wanted the main takeaway to be for people who couldn't relate to that aspect of the book is, holy shit, it's really hard to become a U.S. citizen. Like, I just wanted people to truly understand, like, what the struggle is, how expensive it is, how time-consuming it is, how long it takes. Um, and then as far as what I'm working on, um, I informally sort of focus group this to when I met with your students, um, your book club. Um, but I'm working on a book about two best friends during a pandemic who are basically isolated and estranged from each other and it's their um, emails, text messages, their exchange with each other. Um, so basically, I, I really wanted to do something that wasn't necessarily a love story um, that we're used to seeing in YA, but a story that talks about the enduring relationship between two women and two best friends. Um, so, And it's called I Miss You, I Hate This, which I think really captures what this pandemic has felt like. I love that title. That's great. And uh, Natalia, what do you have coming up? Um, so I, I'll answer the first question first real quick. Um, I I just hope that um, readers will be inspired and empowered to question anyone that tries to silence them, um, especially um, young people of color who, um, who might feel in some ways powerless, um, know that you're not. Um, I am right now working on my next book, which is a YA that's coming out in 2022. And it's untitled, but it's about a Peruvian American immigrant um, living in central Florida who um, she's 17 and she has hip dysplasia and scoliosis. And she's kind of, um, you know, she's had surgeries her whole life and she's now trying to become a mermaid at a famous mermaid attraction in central Florida. And it's just a lot about her finding, um, feeling out of place and feeling displaced and out of alignment in a lot of ways, both within her body and outside of it. And, um, you know, what happens throughout this one summer when she's navigating all those things. Um, and it's, I you know, I didn't, although I did not become a mermaid, um, it is kind of based on my own experiences as someone who grew up and still has dysplasia and scoliosis. Thank you. That sounds like a great read. I'm excited about that. And uh, Kaylin, last, uh, what do you hope readers take away from your book and what are you uh, working on now? Um, so <clears throat> uh, so the, the closing lines of Cinderella is dead. Um, they are, do not be silent, raise your voice, uh, be a light in the dark. And so I think that what I'd like for readers to take away is that your your voice matters and um, this world will try to make you small, try to make you make yourself be small um, and you don't have to be. Um, you are enough just as you are. So that's, that's what I hope readers will take away from it. Um, and then um, as for what I'm working on next, um, I have a YA fantasy, contemporary fantasy out next year with Bloomsbury and I don't have like a title or, well, I have a title, but we haven't announced it yet, but it is, I like to describe it as um, Little Shop of Horrors meets um, The Secret Garden with a little bit of Hades Town thrown in. So, so yeah, so that should be fun. <laughs> That sounds really fun. I'm excited about that too. I'm so excited to read all of y'all's next works. Um, so real quick before I go, I wanted to say for our audience, watch if you're watching live, then make sure you go to the Library Con website and sign up for a prize pack at the bottom. You can win this lovely stack of all the books. We have 10 sets. So we have 10 prizes to give away. You can win all these wonderful books and read them for yourselves. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm um, so glad to have, that, to have had you guys all here. I really appreciate it. And, um, thank you everyone for watching.